Hi, I'm Stefan Goldman. This is my studio. And um, I'll give you a quick walkthrough of uh, what I have here. And um, typically on most of the music I make, I'll use um, synthesizers or electroacoustic instruments such as those two uh, to generate sounds. So in the sound generation stage, I'll, I'll typically just connect a sequencer or some other triggering device to, to one of the synth I have here um, and um, just play around and record like really long sessions, um, you know, like half an hour, an hour, whatever it takes, and um, later I'll cut them. So uh, that's actually how I began doing music, was mostly working with samples. So my approach to synthesis is kind of, um, yeah, looking at it as a sample source, as something uh, where eventually you know, you, you just find a, find a part that, that works, but um, in generating the material, a lot of uh, recording goes on. So uh, typically those instruments would be hooked to um, a hardware recorder, so I don't even have to switch on the computer to, to do any of that. I'll have some effects uh, to, to process stuff. Um, you know, like uh, I really like working with uh, delays and reverbs and uh, distortion a lot. Uh, so that's typically the start of the production. Later on, all the parts go into Ableton, into the computer, where it's uh, being cut and arranged, and ultimately it gets played back out through this desk, uh, which, um, yeah, apparently not that many people use this particular one, but uh, I'm quite fond of it because it has a small footprint, you know, it fits in here, but it has a lot of routing. You have like um, eight aux sends, eight bus, uh, buses you can assign stuff to, um, and that allows me to send stuff back out into EQs, filters, uh, distortion. I have like those guitar distortion pedals, for instance, hooked up to to it. Um, I'll show you later how that works in practice. And um, typically I'll have a lot of reverbs, I'm kind of a reverb junkie, um, that, that come into play in, in Mixdown. So individual tracks can, can get patched into any of those EQs, filters, compressors you see here. And um, it all comes back together in the mix. And um, once that is settled, the mix bus goes into the right side of the setup, uh, which is uh, again EQs, compressors, and um, yeah, just basically uh, devices that deliver like differences in color, different nuances. So uh, I'm trying to look at uh, having like very different compressors, for instance. So I have a couple of uh, variable Mu type uh, tube compressors, but also like a kind of more direct hard uh, VCA compressors such as the API I'm quite fond of. So we get like different colors or, you know, like a very precise parametric equalizer versus more like a um, Pultec type or actually the Pultec 500 modules or the Fern uh, variation on that. So there's like a lot of coloration to be added. And uh, maybe one more thing I need to point out is that I'm not like a purist or high fidelity junkie. I'm more looking really into like different ways of destroying a sound rather than preserving it through the chain. So um, I'll really have no qualms at distorting stuff harshly or uh, transforming it. So typically any signal that goes through the whole thing, it's like 10 coloration stages. You know, most of them very subtle, but uh, things add up. So there's a lot of uh, transformers and um, like different parts that just impact the waveform in different ways. Okay, so once um, the mix is uh, being done, uh, this is the recording side where everything goes goes down this road uh, to the mix bus, except for the even type that's in the mix. But I uh, have this uh, eight channel switcher where it can switch in and out uh, those processes here or chains within those uh, processes uh, to to give like a final cut to to the mix. Typically, the the first stage is an MS processor which divides the signal into mid and side components with a SPL MS master, so you can have different processors on on um, the parts of the signal that are in phase, you know, which are the same left and right, and the other stuff which is differential, which is on uh, typically the the wider parts of the stereo mix, 
So I find that very useful. And um, so I have different processes for the mid and the side signal. I have the bus audio um, arc processor in the mid signal. So this has a parametric EQ, but it also has a very nice transformer, which um, to me, it gives something very, um, like a very chiseled uh, quality to the, to the kick drums in particular. So I really like this one. In the side signal, I have uh, the Aztec EQ. It's kind of an old German strange exotic brand, which no longer exists. So once it goes through MS, it goes through uh, those equalizers here. So those are the Pultec 500 uh, modules. So the one for high and low frequencies, and there's one for uh, mid frequency, mostly used for cutting out stuff in the mid, mid, mid frequencies. So usually get a, if you have a complex mix and you have a lot of, lot of signals, um, they kind of tend to muddle a bit in some ranges and that's very good to, to clear that up for me. Then uh, I have different compressors which I can assign. Uh, I'm a big fan of the API compressors which more or less, you know, they, they sound the same to me like the 2500 or the 527 which I have in the mix. This is the 529 which is just a stereo linked version of that. So that's very good for, for kick drums or for getting uh, kick drums and bass uh, to work together really well. So sometimes, you know, in a mix you have bass that kind of jumps out here and there and this one really puts it in into like the same road as, as the kick drum. So it's very nice for this. Then the Chanda Little Devil I sometimes use with a sidechain filter on. This means it doesn't respond to any low frequency stuff, but it responds to um, chords in the mid-range for instance. So it's very good if you have like too much energy, a little bit of too much energy here and there just to, to, make, to even it out, uh, to make it sit well in the mix. Um, so sometimes I use that. Oh, also um, on the switcher you can flip, uh, so you can have the EQs before the compressor or after the compressor, depending on what you want to achieve. Like sometimes you want the compressor to respond to the raw mix, so to speak. Sometimes you want it, you know, to be less engaged when you already took out stuff that's too much uh, with EQ. So that gives a lot of uh, flexibility to, to have those routing options. Then there's like two more like final stages. One is um, I, I have either this Arnamod compressor or the Fern um, VT, I have to look up, VT7. So both of those, they more or less do the same. So they're both uh, variable mu compressors, which means they either have like a tube circuit that responds, you know, like the more level gets in, the more it compresses, but it's like a very smooth transition. So that's um, like a um, like a way to to work dynamics very naturally you know it's not like as harsh as the VCA type compression um, but the difference is the the fern is like real tube circuitry the Anamod is like an analog model of tube circuitry so there are no tubes in there it's like a solid state emulation it's very interesting and to me it sounds fantastic but um, this one has more coloration and that one doesn't have the coloration so um, the, the fern is kind of transparent it's like it's doing the job without you knowing it's there after the fact in a way and this one is if you really want to have that tube sound ironically without tubes uh, that's the one to go so i have those two options to to use and just for like tweaking details uh, this um, equalizer is something i deploy sometimes like a mastering type uh, parametric equalizer by a German company called Custom Audio Germany and um, so that's a very nice one to, to just you know fix the give it like the last um, uh, little little fixes here and there in terms of uh, frequencies coming out and well that's them being recorded on this digital recorder so again I don't have to play stuff back into the computer I can just you know have it here I have it backed up immediately it's on an SD card so I find that convenient and also Kind of nice in terms of uh, data security so you know if your computer crashes you may lose your session but you don't lose the recording of it so um, always nice to have for me and so that's basically the, the mix bus so it, i did succumb to to build a small modular system here i mostly use it for just generating individual sounds you know i don't do like full jams uh, where like every sound would be out of the modular system but it's very interesting sometimes to to just um, build uh, percussive sounds. That's really interesting for me with uh, modules such as the Intelligent Plonk. That's that's a fantastic one for pretty much all sorts of, sorts of percussive sounds, but also like odd melodies or things that you wouldn't typically build with a polyphonic synthesizer, which usually I prefer working with. 
So um, the the modules you know, give you give you again different colors where you have you know like the super fast like Spayman um, envelope generator the ADSR or the very like slow musical Macbeth um, envelope generator ADSR or you know the uh, multi mode filter by Spayman or the multi mode filter by Macbeth so we have like different different options here. Um, then uh, different things that generate sounds and um, I'm not that much into you know like standard subtractive synthesis with modules. I'd prefer to, to use something like the Oberheim Sam for that. Um, but you know there's a PCO here but I also have like some oddball uh, sound generators such as the Plonk or the um, 2HP Vowel which is very interesting so I'll show you a patch with that in a minute. And um, here are also some kind of like odd uh, delays, reverbs that um, can behave differently than a, than a hardware reverb or a software reverb even uh, because of um, the modulation capabilities. So what else uh, is there to, to know about this? Oh yeah, like one thing I'm really fond of is um, finding like non-standard rhythmic patterns or non-standard tunings. And one way to do this here is like with this module, it's called the Arrhythmia by Plankton Electronics. And it's a clock generator where you can dial in the time of every single step in the clock with those dials and you can terminate it somewhere. So you can build like entirely odd sequences so you can, you know, program like custom shuffles where like every little bit is exactly in, in some location. So um, that's that's something I really love playing playing around with. There's an album I did where this is pretty much the clock for everything. It's called the Vector Rituals. So in, in that album, like every single track has its custom shuffle. And that was mostly the way to, to do those. One patch I have here right now is uh, with the vowel um, oscillator, which like simulates basically a human uh, human voice, and it's like very uh, primitive uh, setting of just like changing vowels from like I U or something like this. Um, so, but I think it sounds uh, very funny, and um, so it goes through a couple of filters and uh, the frequency shifter by Zweiman. And has a bit of delay on it, so let's um, let's check this out. Okay, so I've hooked um, up the the vowel to to this uh, controller here, so I can change the sound of it. Or oh, I could change the frequency of it. Let's see. So it's just like color you get out of the filter, right? We can use another pattern. Or we can modulate the frequency shift, let's see. So most of the time it's entirely useless, right? Um, but like every now and then in a session like this, if I record like 40 minutes, there's like 20 seconds in there that, that I can use on a track, which is a kind of strange ratio, you know, between um, keeping this here and uh, and getting use out of it. But um, it's at least a very like a fun exercise to to, to play around with it. Um, lately, I, I have a lot of um, passion for generating my my own sounds um, with kind of electroacoustic instruments. So we have like an actual physical system which you can touch and then process. So that's something uh, I'm very fond of lately. And here are two examples. One is the um, Leaf Audio Microphonic Soundbox MK2. It's this one. So basically there are some contact microphones in there. So it's stereo. And you can touch those surfaces and those um, appendices here and they all make different different sounds. And um, I'll show you an example in a second. So that's that's something you can play around with endlessly for just you know like textures and and even even like bass lines and uh, so you can you can get all sorts of sounds out of just like this little box. 
And there's another one. This is, um, I think it's called the MPA from uh, Azam Bells, like an Italian instrument builder who does this thing. Again, there's a contact mic somewhere in the inside and you have these like different elements that uh, produce different sounds. So, and um, this is hooked to, there's an input on the, on the Leaf Audio uh, sound box. So um, it's like an instrument preamplifier in there. And I use it for this one because this has no amplification of its own. So these two then go into the Eventide H9000. So, um, you know, you can use some powerful effects to blow up uh, the, the sound that comes up. So let's, um, let's try this. I have to use headphones though, because they pick up sound by the monitors otherwise. So I'll switch off the monitors and let's see what this does. I'm uh, really fond of is uh, polyphonic synthesizers and um, for for many years I had only one synthesizer which was the Waldorf Microwave 2 and um, this is kind of like a contemporary upgrade with with a couple of more options so is the Waldorf Quantum and uh, the one thing I really like about that kind of complex synth is that um, you have everything in place, it's polyphonic, you can, you can store patches, you can come back to ideas, like sometimes I literally uh, go back to patches I did like 15 years ago. Not on this one, because that's not that old, but you know, on, on my older synth, sometimes I rediscover stuff and, and go back at it, and um, also like the learning curve is kind of uh, more pleasant, because uh, sometimes I couldn't figure out 10 years ago, like now I have this idea, so I can call it up and, and continue working on it. And, um, the other thing that's really interesting is um, just there like some specific of you know how things are structured so let's say you have like a synthesis engine at the start then you have um, a filter section then you have an effect and with with something uh, it's the other way around like this one is the Dave Smith Prophet 12 bring it out for a second so what's really uh, fun with this is that it has an effects section between the oscillators and the filter so you can distort the waveforms before filtering them. So that's something that, that has given me a lot of like really interesting sound. But uh, let's go back to, to this one. So this basically has the uh, wavetable engine, such as the earlier microwave, so PPG synth. But it also has um, granular capabilities, um, standard waveforms, you know, sawtooth, sine wave, square wave, and so on and FM. So this is like one thing uh, that can do pretty much everything you ever need. And um, it has analog filters that sound really nice, two of them, so you can do parallel filtering. Um, it has a digital section where you can like bit crush uh, your waveform and then like a full effect section. So it can get very complex very quickly. So it's also easy to get lost, but let's look into such a patch. So, I'll, you know, I'll play, I play around with this typically for, for some time and then record a lot of it and then later cut it and put it into a track. So let's take a look. This is a patch that utilizes the internal arpeggiator. Um, so I don't need like an external sequencer this time. So let's let's see what this does. Like, like, 
basically random notes. Something. And now, since uh, this is like a wavetable synthesizer, you can scroll through the wavetable, which brings out those harmonics here. Here this thing. So that's just scrolling through through the different sections of the of the wavetable and it changes the harmonic structure of it. And then it can distort it. Let's see what this does. Light on the tone so the pitch gets a bit uh, tweaked. Okay, so um, another thing I'm, I'm quite interested in is you know, like trying different uh, structures of pitches so like right now I just played the nose as you as you as you find them on the keyboard but uh, we could go into the modulations and change uh, the space between two tones so like this would be an octave on a keyboard right if you, you go from C to C so that's just like a doubling of the frequency but we can stretch or compress this one let's see what this does <laughs> So it just stretches the tones apart, right? Okay, so that changes the pitch structure, but we can also do the same to, to the rhythmic structure. Let's see how we can do this. So let's look into the ARP. So the arpeggiator gives you uh, patterns that, that have like a specific range. So as many notes as you play, you know, it keeps generating sequences out of that. But we could change the number of notes in it. Let's see what that would do. Okay. And now we, this one has different patterns. So you see like the, the standard one would be this one. But you can you can have like different uh, rhythms which are already incorporated in the synth and we can see what this does. So now we have like an irregular rhythm which is something I'm super fond of. I really like this. So you can get like a very interesting rhythmic textures out of all of such pattern changes. It also has a swing so you can change even the structure within the pattern. Okay, too much. So you can you can get to 
really interesting stuff, I think, uh, very quickly, just by, by using um, a simple arpeggiator where you can, you know, put in variation the duration of the sequence or um, change the pitch structure and so on. So that's stuff I, I really like playing around with. So that's like the experimental part of what I do. And then I just record it and cut whatever works and make a trick out of it, ultimately. Yeah, I'll just um, go into one or two patches, like very simple arpeggiator, just doing like one note, basically. Um, and let's see what we can do with uh, modulating a bit of the basic parameters here. So. Oh, yeah, also a nice thing with the Prophet, it goes like left and right uh, with the voices, so there's like a nice stereo feel to it. But let's see. And so on. So lots of lots of colors. Uh, that's that's something I enjoy a lot. Just just playing around, setting up something simple, and then and seeing where the sound takes you. Let's try another one. Again, very nice that um, stuff can be saved. Let's see what this one does. This one. <laughs> look into a more or less full session where I use uh, the pattern generated with those um, no synthesizers and tried to build a track around it and I'm, I'm still kind of undecided here in which metric pattern the, the kick drum should move but uh, now it's like a on like every three sixteenth notes so it's like a three against four uh, rhythm um, let's just have a listen to it quickly so that's basically what it is. So, so this is like the synth patch. So it's recorded, you know, it's long and it has variation. And like here's the, what can actually pause it here. That's like the kick drum going in three.
And now, um, there are like some specific effects being added uh, uh, coming like after what is enabled. And so for instance, this one, there are like two uh, little WMD crushers. Um, so they're like uh, distortion units. And you can hear the hi-hat going into them, but because they're very harsh on their own, so they sound like this. I've put them through filters to, to cut off like the annoying high-end and this can be tuned a little bit. And um, I quite like playing in real time with, the kind of, with that kind of stuff, so it can go like this. The same applies to uh, the like different reverbs, so I can pull them up and down in real time, which I really like, you know, like riding the fader on reverbs, using it as a kind of like a rhythmic str um, structure in, in the mix. So we can go like this, so there are like several reverbs hooked up. There's a spring reverb, there are the Bricastis, uh, Lexicon 300. So I said I'm a reverb junkie anyway. So let's see, like we have this Lexicon. So it's really just in the background. So this is just like a room texture thing. I think this is the... What is this? Oh. What is this? Oh, it's another reverb. Recasting number two. And that's a spring reverb here. It's like this pedal. Uh, it's like a... The game changer light pedal, so it has like a interesting circuit that's triggered by the levels and it changes, so it's not just a spring. It's kind of interesting. And this one here is like the was a major space station, you know, the the reissue. I also have the the original, but um, this is always on the mix with me. It's like a delay that you can put on everything. So it's like this. So this gives, you know, like a lot of space because like everything bounces off of it, so... So if you take it out... So, um, very quickly, what's happening here is that those individual tracks, they um, go through some of the equalizers and compressors. So, for instance, the bass, I found it was a bit, you know, like all over the place dynamically. So, it goes through the Anamod 660, which is like the little version of uh, the one I also have in the mastering chain. So, that's like a very mood type compressor. Uh, API 527, which is good to, you know, catch like individual peaks. So, the first one is just generally shaping and the other one is kind of uh, limiting excessive elements. Um, API 550B equalizer is uh, very, very useful to get the tonality right of um, the individual signals. I also absolutely love for kick drums or drum bus, uh, the Helios 69 freeze, which are hidden down here. So um, that's like an original input module of the um, uh, Helios consoles back in the 60s, you know, like all the classic uh, Led Zeppelin, Rolling Stones and so on uh, recordings were done with those kind of things. And those are unique in bringing out bass. So it's very good if you have like a weak kick drum, you can, you can give it like a full body with a, with a bass control on this one, but also the high end, um, the high frequency equalizer is tremendous. Um, so that's, that's um, an amazing thing to have. I also uh, have the Chandler EQs, the tone control on the bass, I believe. And uh, what else? Yeah, the, the distortion units, they go through the MOOC filters um, 
which are very nice because they have like an envelope dynamic uh, control. So they, they open with and close with a signal. So that's a very nice thing. If we go to the, let me see if I can have that individually. Where is it? Here. So, okay, that's like what goes into the distortion. So if we open the first order, it's like really harsh. So these can, you know, take, take out the harshness and uh, also have like two different distortion units left and right with different uh, kind of wave shaper distortion patterns. Um, so they bring out different parts of the signal. So you can get like this stereo percussion effect with it, which, which I'm quite fond of. So yeah, that's so basically how, how the mix works. And oh yeah, sometimes... Um, uh, the manly, the massive passive is like if like one signal wouldn't sit with anything else, like that's the one where you can when where you can put anything uh, right in the mix so to to make it sit. So uh, yeah, kind of kind of enjoy having lots of colors and options available. So all right, so uh, that's basically my workflow here. If you have any questions, uh, feel free to to drop them in the comments, and uh, I'll try to get back to you uh, as early as possible. Thank you for watching.